Welcome back, everybody. Let's jump right into it. Primate taxonomy, right? The Linnaean taxonomy. Um, in our discussion of taxonomy, uh, we are going to break down the 200 to 300 primate. I'm not going to go through every species, obviously, but um, all of the primates that exist, we're going to break this down into four groups, taxonomic groups. We have suborders. So primate is the order. Then we're going to get smaller suborders, infraorders, parvorders, and superfamilies. Um, and uh, we'll focus on the specializations and things that distinguish these groups from each other. Because as I mentioned in the previous power, uh, in the previous lecture, um, you're going to be doing skull identification, not species identification, skull. And you're going to be doing suborder, infraorder, parvorder, superfamily identification. One of those that I already introduced to you is primate versus non-primate. And in those skulls, what you're going to look for right away are going to be things like heterodont teeth and especially that post-orbital bar. But how do we break down the differences between the living primate groups? That's what we're gonna go through in this PowerPoint. So let me first introduce you to uh, taxonomy. The smallest group within a taxonomy are going to be the scientific names. And you're gonna start seeing these a lot over um, the rest of the material. And you're going to need to use them properly in your assignment. So scientific names have two parts, the genus, which is going to be capitalized and the species, which is gonna be lowercase. And the whole scientific name should be in italics. So our scientific name is Homo sapien. Homo is the genus, sapien is the species. Now, primates also have common names. So our common name is human, right? Um, chimp is a common name, but their species name, their scientific name is pantroglodytes. So make sure that um, you're using, you can use both, right? But when asked for the scientific name, what I want is the genus species, as I have indicated here, um, the common name would be chimp, gorilla, bonobo, human, right? So primate suborders, there's two primate suborders. All primates are either strepsirene or haplorene. Now strepsirene are the most primitive of the primates. They are the earliest ones to evolve and they're the ones that maintain most of, uh, more of the kind of mammalian rodent-like traits from which we evolved. And these are some of the traits that you're going to be looking for if I were to give you a skull and say, is this a strepsirene or a haplorene? These are the traits in the bone that you wanna look for. So long rostrum with a tooth comb. So you're seeing the tooth comb here in this bottom slide, but let me show you what a long rostrum is as well. That's going to be the length of the snout. Um, you can see here in the rostrum length, I have it. So look at how much longer the rostrum is or the snout is in a strepsirene comparatively to a haplorene. So that's one trait that you're looking for that differentiate, differentiates these two uh, uh, suborders. The tooth comb is also going to be a dead giveaway. This is where there's six incisors that pull forward. They don't have any value for eating per se. They are grooming. Um, the tooth comb is for a social grooming activity. Now, strepsirene are also still quite dependent on smell, and they use scent marking. And some of the things that indicate their dependency on smell is going to be this long rostrum, right, as well as a wet nose and whiskers. So the wet nose is called renaria. Haplorene have a dry nose, um, and they do not have whiskers. The wet nose and the whiskers are going to uh, collect a whole lot more sense data, uh, smell data that allow for that primate to um, interpret their environment. Haplorines lose this trait. Um, now just note, by the way, that you are not going, these would not be appropriate answers to a skull identification. You cannot see a wet nose, whiskers, or any of these following traits in the skull. Only use traits you can see in the skull for skull identif uh, identification questions on your quiz. However, there are of course non-skull traits here. So um, strepsirene still have slightly lateral eyes. One of the traits of primates is stereoscopic vision, right? Forward facing eyes. And strepsirene do have this, but they're slightly lateral facing. And they also tend to have what's called a tapetum lucidium. Now this is a reflective layer on the eyeball 
that allows for them to see more effectively at night. Haplorines don't have this. Haplorines live almost exclusively during the day and have directly forward facing eyes. Strepsorines still have mobile ears, right? Like your dog or cat. Their ears can move around, right? So that they can hear the sounds around them. But haplorines have stationary ears. Strepsorines also tend to retain one grooming claw on their index finger, um, whereas haplorines have, have no claws at all, all nails on every single one of their digits. Finally, strepsorines have a shorter maturation period than haplorines have, meaning that their babies are born more developed and they mature quicker than members of the haplorine suborder. Now, what this allows for haplorines is a larger and more complex brain. One other element of skull identification that you will be able to utilize to indicate whether a primate is a strepsorine or a haplorine is going to be the postorbital plate. So all primates have a postorbital bar. In the top, we have a strepsorine, and in the bottom, we have a haplorine. Notice that in both suborders, pickups, excuse me, there is a circle of bone around the eye that fully encircles, fully encases the eye. This is the postorbital bar. This would not be a distinguishing feature between the suborders. What is a distinguishing feature between the suborders is the postorbital plate. So note in the top strepsorine image that you can see through the eye cavity, actually to this kind of black space in the back. And you can actually put your finger through um, the eye socket of a strepsorine like you can a dog or a cat. But among haplorines, there's this plate. This is called the postorbital plate. And this is believed to keep the eyes stationary and is a distinctive trait of haplorines. So if you have a skull identification quiz, you can use the uh, postorbital plate as an indicator if as to whether it's a strepsorine or haplorine, along with the long rostrum. And you can see another example of the plate in this image as well. Notice that there's no plate in the strepsorine on the right, but there is a plate in the haplorine on the left. Now, strepsorines are broken down into two major groups, lemurs and lorises. Um, lemurs are found in one place in the world, and that's the island of Madagascar and maybe some of the smaller islands surrounding that particular nation. They are extinct everywhere else. Um, there are larger lemurs, that are diurnal or active during the day, um, and they have a wide range of diet. And then there are smaller insect feeding nocturnal lemurs. A couple examples that I thought I would share with you um, would be ringtail lemurs and shifakas. So ringtail lemurs are here on the left. You're probably familiar with this species. And if you know Zubali Zoo, then you may also know what the shifakas are. Um, but these are both great examples of strepsorines that are clingers and leapers. You can see just how incredibly long the legs are in shifakas. Shifakas are fascinating. Their legs are so derived that they actually cannot stand still on them. They have to hop um, because of the length and strength of very specialized legs for the leaping method that they use in the wild. Um, but you can also see in our ringtail lemur, nice long feet for that leaping, um, as well as nice strong legs here. This tail is going to be helpful um, for balancing, you know, a little bit, but really it's more for signaling. You can also see those mobile ears in this individual and that snout that's pulling forward. Now, I thought I would share a film um, about the Shifakas lemur. Um, Shifakas lemurs make a treacherous journey for food. So this is a BBC film clip um, that shows you this beautiful primate, right? Again, look, you can see their mobile ears. Um, you can see their snout and this is their wet nose, right? Um, so this is a strepsorine um, and it has these general strepsorine traits. It has general primate traits, forward facing eyes, larger brain and cognitive capacity than um, non-primates. But the shifaka is specialized. And watching this film, pause it, watch, note that the specific specializations that this species has evolved in order to get food in a very unique environment in Madagascar. So I'm gonna uh, ask you to pause, watch this particular film to give you a good visual.
adorable, right? Enormously inhospitable environment for most primates or for, for most animals, in fact. And so for the shifaka to actually have a, a, an adaptation that allows them to take advantage of this treacherous environment means that they're going to probably have a food source all to themselves, which is beneficial to survival. Strepsirenes also have what are called lorises. Now, lorises are found in more places in the world, tropical forests um, and woodlands in South Asia, um, like India, Sri Lanka, um, Southeast Asia, as well as Africa. Now, lorises are exclusively nocturnal. You can see the size of their eyes are a good indicator of that. Um, but notice that um, their eyes are facing forward. This is a, a primate trait. Um, but they have strepsirene traits, um, strepsirene specializations. They still have mobile ears, this little wet nose. Um, and this you know, particular group of primates, lorises, uses a unique climbing quadrupedalism. They have sticky pads on their toes and they tend to move very, very slowly. Um, because they're nocturnal, they are almost exclusively insectivores. Um, which means, of course, that they're going to have those sharpened molars. All traits that are specialized that you could reflect on were you to choose this primate for your paper. Couple examples, the slow loris on the left and the galago or the bush baby on the right. The bush baby is a great um, and loved treat, meat treat um, for chimpanzees in this particular area. They are known to hunt them. We'll see that later. Um, but notice what I was talking about with these little kind of sticky fingers that are there for a very slow movement in the trees. Now, um, I thought I would share another video with you um, regarding endangerment. So this is a really cool program called the Little Fire Face Project. Um, and their goal in this project is to build bridges over areas that are dangerous for lorises to cross because lorises are very slow, right? Um, it's like a sloth. Um, you know, if they're going to try to move across a busy street, they're probably going to die. And this is um, one of the things which is, of course, endangering them at their speed. So this program is building little bridges, hoping, um, hoping that um, they can encourage the slow lorises to use these um, and avoid the endangerment of things like traffic. So I thought I would uh, show this to you. Let's take a minute, pause my lecture and feel free to watch this. Great, right? L lovely program um, that is uh, hopefully going to make a huge difference in, in the survival of, of lorises in that particular area. Now, um, we had suborders, strepsirene and haplorene. These break down themselves. So infraorders, strepsirenes break down into two infraorders, lemurs and lorises, which we just discussed. Haplorene breaks down into two infraorders, tarsiers, which is kind of a stray little branch of evolution, and then anthropoids. Anthropoids include hundreds of species, including all monkeys, apes, and humans, while tarsiers are a distinctive genus. Um, there's about 18 species that are still quite primitive, but not primitive enough to be classified as strepsirenes. <coughs> Excuse me. So haplorene tarsiers, this is the infant order tarsier. Tarsiers are very distinctive. Um, they are exclusively nocturnal, and I think their eyes are a giveaway. Um, the size of their eyes would be like if we as humans had grapefruits for eyes. So very, very large um, that are going to allow them uh, to see effectively in the wild. Um, they are found um, on islands in Southeast Asia and they're very small. Um, they tend, of course, to have as nocturnal primates an insect small vertebrate diet. And they use a form of leaping, which is extremely specialized for them. And you'll see, I mean, almost their entire body is the leg right here. And you're gonna to get to see this in action here um, in a moment. They are specialized in that they have a fused tibia and fibula or the lower leg bones so that they have an even greater amount of strength um, in, in their jumping path. So they have um, a unique form of leaping that you know, were you to use this primate for your assignment, you could say, well, it's a primate, eyes are facing forward, brain is larger, but it's specialized in its method of leaping locomotion due to its fused tibia and fibula.
Now, while it looks a lot like the primitive strep serines we've seen, it lacks, first of all, molecularly, we know that it is not um, a strep serine. It's more closely related to haplorines um, in its DNA. But its physical traits that distinguish it from a strep serine are in that it doesn't have a snout, it doesn't have a long rostrum, um, and it doesn't have a renaria, it does not have a wet nose. So the tarsier skull is very fascinating, right? Were this to pop up for you on a quiz, it's going to be indicated by extremely large forward-facing eye orbits with a post-orbital plate. Now, don't uh, mistake this minor gap here, which is actually just for the nerve endings to reach um, the, the um, visual cortex. Tarsiers have a plate and they do not have a tooth comb. I thought I would share with you uh, the cutest little predator, right, invertebrate predator, um, and give you kind of a visual of the jumping skills of this particular primate. So please take a moment, pause this lecture, and watch this video in your PowerPoint. Aren't they adorable? They might freak you out. You're on one side or the other, right? They either terrify you and freak you out or they're absolutely incredibly adorable. The only place that I know that you can see these is actually at the Bronx Zoo um, in their kind of nocturnal environment um, uh, captivity exhibit, which is really fascinating. But I love them. Tarsier is very cool primate, definitely a good contender for a paper. Now, among the Haplorine, right? Haplorine breaks down to tarsier and anthropoid. Anthropoid then breaks down to two parvorders. The first um, is platyrene, which means new world monkey or monkeys found in the new world, Central and South America. And then catarine, which refers to old world primates. And note that I didn't use the word monkey because catarine is actually gonna break down even further, right? Catarine refers to old world primates, which includes 78, at least 78 species of monkeys found in the old world, Asia and Africa, but also apes and humans. Platyrene refers only to new world monkeys in the new world, um, South and Central America, and includes at least a hundred species. Now, new world monkeys, um, I have 70 species here, right? There's some, uh, I need to update this PowerPoint so that they match, but um, it depends on really what research you're looking at and how they break the species down. So um, platyrenes are almost exclusively diurnal. They're active during the day, um, which means they eat a wide range diet, fruits, leaves, and insects. Now they have um, a 2133 dental formula uh, lateral facing nostrils and are almost exclusively arboreal. So the 2133 dental formula, what I mean by that is that they have two incisors here in the front, one canine, three premolars, get my numbers correct, and then three molars in each quadrant or quarter of the jaw. Two, one, three, three. Two incisors, one canine, three premolars, three molars. This is different from catarine. So in your quizzes, if I give you a skull and I say, is this platyrene or catarine? One immediate element you can look at is the teeth. Count those teeth. One, two premolars, one, two, three molars. And that is because the catarine dental formula is 2123 compared to platyrene 2133. So this is going to be a good distinctive trait to familiarize yourself with. Additionally, nostrils are different between um, new world and old world primates. On the right hand side is the new world primate. Note that the left, the not the nostrils, the nostrils are facing a little bit laterally comparatively to the chimp, which is a catarine, and those nostrils are facing downwards. Please note that this is not a relevant answer to skull identification. You cannot see nostrils in a skull. So please do not use this as an answer to um, whether or not a skull is uh, platyrene or catarine. Um, one other element though, sorry, I skipped this one, is um, an ear tube. But you know what, let me come back to that um, when I get to our primates. However, um, note in our catarine primate right here, you see this small tube where my cursor is. This is an ear tube that steadies the ear canal 
Platyrenes don't have that. Also a distinctive trait you can use to identify their skulls. Um, and I'll show this again uh, here in a moment. Just a couple examples, golden lion tamarins and capuchins. Um, one thing that many New World primates or platyrene primates have is a grasping tail, um, which is going to help them, um, you know, from falling, right, to keep them from falling. Um, and a lot of these have great specializations in them. One that I thought I'd share with you are spider monkeys. So spider monkeys are highly specialized. They have a, a specialized method of locomotion. Um, they have only four fingers instead of five. They actually lost the thumb in exchange for long grasping fingers uh, because they are surviving and almost never touch the ground, um, sometimes well over a hundred feet into the air. They have a highly specialized grasping tail that is going to be like a fifth limb. And you'll see where that comes in handy when you watch this particular clip. So let's take a moment, pause, and I'll give you a visual on why the spider monkey, a new world primate, has only four fingers. Are they not incredibly adorable? And again, highly specialized. A great example for your paper because very clearly a primate, right? Forward facing eyes, much larger brain comparatively to other species, but many unique specializations so that they can survive in their distinctive environment. Now, catarines then break down into two superfamilies, Circopithecoidea, old world monkeys, at least 78 species of them found in Africa and Asia, and then Hominoidea, which includes apes and humans, for which there are at least, at least six species and, and one living human species. So Haplorine, Catarine, Circopithecoidea. Um, these are old world monkeys. Habitats for old world monkeys range much more dramatically than any other primate so far. We have old world monkeys living in tropical forests, um, in deserts, in snow covered areas in Japan and China, and there are at least 78 known species. Now these primates tend to have um, more terrestrial quadrupedalism, and some arborealism. They also tend to be the first to have an omnivorous diet. So we're starting to eat a little bit more meat and um, we see the change from the 2123 dental formula to the two, excuse me, 2133 in new world monkeys compared to old world monkeys, 2123, as well as a honing complex. So let me show you that um, here. The honing complex is something that old world primates uh, have, old world monkeys have, that allows for, is a, there's a small gap you can see here between the bottom canine and the first premolar that the canine, the top canine is then going to slide into. And as it slides in and out, it's actually sharpening itself. This is going to be something which Circopithecoidea has in order to consume an omnivorous diet. They also have some of the things I already mentioned, downward facing nostrils, um, and they lack a grasping tail. So they still have tails uh, among old world monkeys. But as we saw in that terrestrial uh, primate example, um, the tail has no purpose. It's just kind of hanging there. And because circopithecoids tend to live terrestrially, quadrupedally on the ground, they have also evolved some callus pads on their butts so that they can sit down. Now I'm gonna come back to the bilophodont teeth here in a moment. Just a reminder about the ear tube. We can see a bony ear tube. So if you have a platyrene versus a catarine, and I'm asking you, I give you a skull, I say, is this platyrene, is this catarine? Count the molars, right? And also look for the ear tube. There is no bony ear tube. This little large hole here is where the mandible connects to the jaw. You're looking for a small bony ear tube for catarine. The honing complex is also going to be a giveaway. Um, and I mentioned, sorry, bilophodont molars. So let me actually come back to that. Bilophodont molars means that um, the teeth of catarines, uh, the molars of catarines have four cusps on them, right? By, um, and can be split into four sections. But I'll show you what I mean and what the difference is in an upcoming slide here. One of the biggest things that changes with catarine primates 
um, is that we start to see the development of sexual dimorphism. So I introduced sexual dimorphism to you with birds of paradise um, among primates, right? It's, it's very similar. Uh, sexual dimorphism refers to the differences between males and females. So you have primary differences like genitalia, but then you have secondary differences that evolve as a result of hormones um, and things like that. And in um, old world primates, you're going to find that males tend to be significantly larger, if not two to three times the size of females. Um, males grow to be larger because they have an advantage, right? Um, this is better protection for females um, who then are gonna continually sexually select large mates. So you're seeing here baboons, a female baboon here and a male baboon. And notice huge differences, right? The male baboon's teeth are two, three times the size. They're physically twice the size, at least of the females. They have these large mane like um, kind of feathery hairs that come out that make them appear to be significantly larger. And baboons especially are notoriously aggressive. They have um, some of the highest rates of testosterone in the entire world. And again, notorious violence and aggression, which we're going to see here in a moment. Now, females have likely driven the evolution of this sexual dimorphism because when we move to the ground, when catarine primates start living on the ground, they're coming in contact with a heck of a lot more predators and now need this physical size, these dangerous traits, this aggressive tendencies um, of the males in order to protect the females and the young. The females don't change all that much because, you know, as we saw with the birds of paradise um, and the quantitative versus the qualitative examples, you know, female primates tend to be more selective like other um, female animals. Uh, we have a finite amount of times we can reproduce. So we're going to be very selective in who we choose, but males are gonna be trying to get as much of their DNA out there as they possibly can and have as many partners as they can. Um, so females, men are gonna be less selective, right? But females are going to select, which means that females are not going to change very much over time, but females are going to cause males to change over time by selecting the traits that they believe are going to be beneficial for the survival of their young. So we don't really see sexual dimorphism in arboreal primates because uh, you know there's not a lot of predators and um, a larger size is not conducive to moving around efficiently in the trees. So these are gonna be some big changes we see in, these, uh, in the species of Caterine as we move to a more terrestrial environment. Now, I thought I would show this clip just to give you an idea of what I mean about the um, uh, notoriously kind of aggressive baboon troops. Um, so this is a, a quick video of baboon troops clashing over territory. Now note um, a few things. So first of all, in this image right away, you can see these downward facing nostrils. You can see this aggressive movements um, of the male. You're going to see that they are aggressive, not only towards stranger males, but even towards the females in the group. Um, there tends to be some strong political hierarchies and violence. Um, uh, used by the leaders of these particular groups and troops. Um, they're always trying to expand their territory, expand their size in warlike behavior. So very cool behavioral examples that we'll return to a little bit more in primate behavior, but feel free to stop, pause this lecture video and watch this video in the PowerPoint. Scary, right? You know, people give gorillas a bad rap, but the baboon is the one I don't want to run into, into, you know, in a dark alley at night. So our last super family, our last breakdown, Caterine breaks down into Circopithecoid and Hominoid, right? Now, Hominoids are apes. Um, apes are distinguished by the following things, even larger in body size. Um, no tail at all. The tail is completely gone. We have a tiny little tailbone, right? But there's no tail. In Hominoids, the arms are much longer than the legs in apes, not in humans. We're a little bit separate. We'll come back to that a little bit later. Now, apes is what we're talking about here in terms of hominoid. Long arms, um, broad chests, and shoulders for brachiation, as well as a distinctive molar formula of Y5. I'll show you here in a moment. And significantly more complex behaviors, cognitive abilities, and longer infant development. So let me first look at the teeth and jaw. When we have the old world monkey, Circopithecoidea, have what we call a bilophodont structure and a longer 
more narrow jaw. So if I give you a skull and I say, is this a circle pithecoid or a hominoid? Jump right to the molars. Do they have four cusps or five? Why five is going to be indicative of a hominoid. Is the jaw long or is it short and stout? A long narrow jaw is going to be more associated with an old world monkey circle pithecoid than a hominoid. The shoulder is also going to be a big change here. Notice in um, terrestrial um, primates, like the one on the top, this is a baboon, that the shoulder blades are lateral and the arms are facing directly down to the ground, right? Which means kind of a limited range of locomotion like this. Apes have a change in the shoulder. They are going to move those shoulder blades laterally, right, further out, and they're gonna get that broad chest, which is going to make this movement, right? You're gonna get a lot more force and, and um, distance with this movement. So we're going to see a wider chest cavity altogether among apes, even wider among humans. Gibbons are my absolute favorite. Gibbons and Siamangs um, are uh, uh, extremely cool, very vocal primates. We're gonna see some of this in our communication discussion in primate behavior. They are what we call the lesser apes. They're the smallest of the apes, but they are highly specialized in their methods of brachiation and in a lot of their communications. So um, gibbons have an incredible specialization in terms of how they brachiate. They are super, super fast and incredibly strong. And so I thought that you would enjoy this quick video that shows you just how fast gibbons can actually swing through the trees. Where do you, to choose them as a primate for your paper, you know, they're a primate, they have larger brains, they have forward facing eyes, but they then have unique specializations for their environment. So take a moment, pause the lecture, watch this video to get an idea of what I'm talking about in terms of these brachiator specializations, and even maybe compare them a little bit to how you saw baboons moving terrestrially on the ground. My favorite. Gibbons are my absolute favorite. I love to get them started with their whooping and hollering. Um, and I would strongly, strongly suggest you go visit the Gibbon Conservation Center. But you can also see gibbons and siamangs at the Los Angeles Zoo. Now, orangutans are found um, in one place in the world. Uh, these, this is uh, one of the species of ape, greater apes, great apes that exist. Um, they are very unique though, as an ape. Um, they are um, almost exclusively arboreal. So they, they rarely come down to the ground and they're found only in two places in the world, Borneo and Sumatra. Um, males are twice the size of females and have a lot of, um, you can see flanges in the face and things um, that differentiate the males from the females in the species, very pronounced sexual dimorphism. They are also principally frugivores, meaning that they are almost exclusively fruit eaters. So they have that specialization of the grinding flatter molars compared to let's say the great ape of uh, the gorilla, who is a primary a leaf eater, they're going to have those sharper molars, right? To break down that food. Gorillas are also you know, unique. Uh, people often choose this for their paper. They are the largest living primate. Um, they are confined to a very specific area in Central Africa um, and they are gigantic. Males weigh um, 400, sometimes beyond that pounds with females weighing about half of that. And males have very, very specialized structures in the skull, huge sagittal crests um, for muscle attachment, just to deal with the sheer size of their body. Um, they are technically brachiators, but adult males cannot brachiate because of their sheer size. Females and children can though. Um, and so when they get to be adults, they use a specialized terrestrial method of walking called knuckle walking. They have special pads on their knuckles and they essentially walk on their fists, which differs from baboons that walk terrestrially on the tips of their fingers. Now, chimpanzees are found in equatorial Africa as well, very similar area to where gorillas are, in fact, in resource competition with them. They're very similar in terms of their anatomical um, distributions, their body shapes, but chimpanzees are significantly smaller in size, you know, in the hundred pound area um, with less sexual dimorphism than the other great apes. Um, 
but otherwise they are very similar. They have very similar brachiating abilities in the chest and they use a knuckle walking quadrupedalism on the ground. Chimpanzees and bonobos um, are equally related, 99.9999% related to each other. Bonobos are considered to be a subspecies and are found in one area south of the Zaire River in Africa. Um, they are highly endangered um, and look very much like chimpanzees. You would be pressed. Um, I would be incredibly impressed if actually you could tell the difference, super minor differences um, in terms of their erect posture, uh, their hands, and some of the pink tones um, on their skin, but otherwise also follow the same kind of body pattern. They are generally brachiators, but also quadrupedal knuckle walkers. But um, some of the major differentiations between the apes are going to be in their behavior. And we will have the opportunity to explore that in the next lecture. Um, obviously I can't cover two to 300 primate species. So I've tried to give you kind of a wide range of examples so that you can choose a primate for your activity in this class that you find interesting. Um, but also I hope that I've, I've clarified um, in these two lectures, first, the things which put all of the groups we looked at in this lecture into one order, the primate order. But then how that primate order gets slowly broken down into smaller and smaller groups with unique specializations. Um, all of these specializations are of course adaptions uh, adaptations uh, to, for natural selection, right, to increase their survival. We're going to see that behaviors are also selected. Um, and so in our next PowerPoint, we're going to look a little bit more um, at primate behavior. I think you will be, you know, shocked and in fact humbled a little bit um, at the intelligence um, of these uh, primates, non-human primates, and just the, the, the amount of behaviors, emotions, and insights that we share. So we'll get a chance to explore that soon. Um, as always, please let me know if you have any questions, general forum, office hours if I have them, or shoot me an email. Otherwise, I will see you for our next lecture. Bye.